Hello. I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's event. My name is Jim Peck Gray, and I'm the president of the Harvard Law School Forum. Thank you again for coming tonight, and now I'd like to present Professor Tom Jackson, who will introduce Mr. Turner. Thank you. Um, in introduction, I think my, my job is a little hard, um, because I think in Ted Turner you have someone who's a person where the sum is greater than the parts. Um, that's not to say the parts aren't pretty impressive in themselves, and I guess my job is simply to tell you what these parts sort of look like, the sort of resume parts, and then I think you'll be pleasantly surprised because I think you'll get only a clue of his breadth from this. Now, starting out with Turner Advertising Company, which he became president of in his mid-20s, his business interests have developed in uh, what appear to me to be two distinct directions operating under the umbrella of Turner Broadcasting System, Inc., which he's chairman of the board and president of. Um, the list doesn't include an advertising company, and he hasn't told me what's happened to the advertising company. On the one side is, the, is his electronic media, news and entertainment group. He originated the superstation concept in 1976, transmitting his WTBS signal to cable systems nationwide. In 1980, Turner Broadcasting System moved into news um, with the cable news network, commonly known as CNN, which he has a tie on saying CNN, so you'll know, the first all news television network. This was augmented in 1981 by Headline News, another all news television network, and in 1982 by CNN Radio, an all news radio network. In 1986, Turner Broadcasting System both acquired MGM and quickly sold off its motion picture and television production business to United Artists and Lorimar Telepictures. The point of this exercise, it seems that it leaves Turner Broadcasting System with MGM's 3,500 plus feature film library. There's also the sports side of his business, a bit of live entertainment. The Turner Broadcasting System owns the Atlantic Braves and the Atlantic Hawks. Related to these business interests are several other ventures. Mr. Turner serves as the chairman of the board of the Better World Society a nonprofit organization which he helped found that produces and distributes television programming on issues of planetary survival. He was also in on the creation of the Goodwill Games, which in partnership with the Soviet Union puts on a summer multi-sport international competition every four years, the first of which was held last July in Moscow. One can go on in, in something that could be characterized as leisure for most people, but which sounds suspiciously like work in Ted Turner's hands. He is a world-class yachtsman, uh, not just a organizer and uh, owner of sports. And that guy is in 1977, he led this country's successful defense of the America's Cup. He also sits on the board of numerous organizations, including the American Federation of the Blind, the Martin Luther King Center of Nonviolent Change, Friends of the Earth, and the NAACP. One would think this was enough, but, but as I said at the beginning, one could do all of these things, perhaps even scare CBS in the works, and still not be Ted Turner. I think this is a case where the sum is, in fact, greater than the parts. We're lucky to have him here tonight. Um, perhaps he'll tell me what happened to his advertising company, but if you're lucky, perhaps he won't. Ted? Thank you very much. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, because uh, I'm trying to decide what to say tonight, uh, how many of you, uh, when I spoke at Kennedy School of Government last fall, how many of you were there? I know there were a couple, but hopefully not too many. One. Okay, good. Maybe a repeat, okay? Uh, that's, number, that's number one. And with WTBS, we show a lot of older programs. Uh, I don't think reruns are necessarily uh, bad if they're good reruns. <clears throat> now, how many of you uh, heard Carl Sagan last week? Raise your hand. Okay. About a fourth. Well, I, we were at, at dinner tonight. Carl Sagan is a good friend of mine, and uh, we've had him on our, on our network on, on numerous occasions. I've met with him, and uh, those of you that had the opportunity to, to hear him, uh, I'm sure it was a very enjoyable and, 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 and a very rewarding experience, and I understand the, 
major topic of his uh, address was to to that we need to stop the uh, nuclear arms race and find better things to do than use outer space for military purposes. And I certainly uh, agree with that. But I won't, well, I won't make that the emphasis of, of my talk since a lot of you have, have already have already heard it except to, to mention it a little bit. So I'll start basically with, with background and I'll try and impart to you the, in the 25 minutes allocated uh, for my original speech, then we'll have 20 or 25 minutes of, of questions and answers which will be a, a lot of fun and very illuminating too, hopefully. Uh, with, with, because I really have had an extremely interesting life that has gone through many phases. Uh, I, I, I was born in 1938, and uh, I remember when my father came back from World War II, and I remember when he went, and, and I, I, I can remember the struggle that we had, that he had as a small businessman to uh, make a success of his, of his little uh, outdoor advertising or billboard business, which he built from, from scratch, the struggles that, that my family had back in, a, in the... Uh, late 40s, early 50s, uh, when I was in high school. And it was an entirely different world than the world we live in, live in today. Well, for one thing, there are two and a half times as many people on this planet as there were when I was born in 1938. And there are five billion people here now. There were two billion people then. And by the year 2000, there'll be six billion people. So hopefully I'll make it in the next 12 or 13 years. The world population will have tripled, and uh, I won't yet be 60 years old, which is the second biggest problem in the world. The nuclear arms race is the first. That can be, that can be stopped uh, almost immediately. In my opinion, uh, the Soviets are ready to stop right now. I hope that, uh, that our government will uh, meet them halfway and, and stop that insanity. That can be stopped. Getting control of the population will be will be a much more difficult, uh, a more difficult thing to do. And, and the third real problem that we have on the globe today is the destruction of the environment, which is mainly a result of, 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 of more people on the planet that, than it can sustain on a uh, renewable basis. Uh, that's the way, we're, the way we're supporting so many people on the world, is mining our topsoils, uh, cutting down our forests for firewood and, and, and for fuel and uh, just generally uh, destroying the very life support systems of which we, which we depend upon. We're like a bunch of termites uh, in a house where there was one little group of termites that lived very nicely and there was enough wood there for them to eat ad infinitum, but they kept breeding and breeding and the next thing you know there were millions of them in this house. They ate the house and then there was nothing left for them to eat, so they starved to death. And that's exactly what we're doing as a, uh, as a species. And, and, and at the end of World War II, in 1946, the first nation on this planet, for the first time in the history of this world, admitted that they had a population problem. So that problem only occurred for the first time in 1946. That was a nation of India. And uh, as of last year, almost 80% of the nations in the world have some sort of population uh, control program. Uh, our nation is in that particular area is one of the most backward in the world as we are in several other critical areas at the present time. Uh, our nation uh, dropped out of the United Nations Fund for po Population Activities. Uh, we're no longer contributing one thin dime to uh, the most important population program in the world as of, uh, as of this year. So those are the three problems. Uh, when I was a boy, and in, really until six years ago, uh, when I started CNN and, and started underwriting Captain Cousteau's programs, I, my, most of my uh, opinions were the opinions of the current administration. I was very fearful and, ha and uh, distrustful, and I guess uh, I hated communism and hated communists. I'd never met any, but I hated them because my father told me to hate them, and I guess I'd grown up... Uh, being told by our society that we ought to hate them. I remember uh, growing up in the South, although I was born in the North and spent my first 10 years up there. When I moved down to the South uh, when I was 10 years old to Georgia, 
I was absolutely appalled uh, by segregation because I went to an integrated public school in Ohio before I went down. I was appalled by it, but it existed. And I saw uh, when you don't have any contact with people, and we didn't have, children in the South did not have social contact for the most part with blacks when I was a little boy. Uh, you become distrustful. Uh, you're told you're not supposed to socialize or meet with these sort of people, that they're somewhat different than we are, and, uh, and you stay apart from them, and they stay apart from you. Uh, and then I saw that break down, thankfully and happily, during my lifetime. One of the great things that's happened. And uh, here we are, raising hell as we should be in South Africa, where they're doing exactly the same thing that we did in the South just 40 years ago. Uh, it's behind us, and it's as, as is slavery behind us that uh, had existed in the world, virtually all over the world, practiced all over the world, until uh, about the time of the, the American uh, War between the states, at which time it virtually disappeared all over the world in a very short period of time. So what I'm saying is we can change. Just because we have done things wrong over periods of time, uh, and we acted foolish and uh, barbaric uh, in the past does not mean that we have to do it uh, anymore. You can take, take two nations in this, on this planet today, the Germans and the Japanese, both of which uh, prior to World War II were run by regimes that were built on nationalistic fervor and hatred for everyone else. And they were teaching their young people, their children, that from the day that they were born in both Japan and in Germany. And today, those nations, uh, both of them, after uh, the devastation and destruction uh, that occurred to, the, to their countries during World War II, uh, are two of the most peace-seeking and friendliest and, and best citizens on this planet, neither of which, uh, particularly Japan, uh, will not engage in the arms race that's going on. They, they engage in commerce. They make VCRs and 35-millimeter cameras. They, they're making the things that people want in this world. And our country is uh, trying to force them to uh, rearm. I mean, you know, I, I think what we ought to do is try and disarm rather than getting other nations that want to, you know, do this. I mean, I think Japan is much safer than we are, although no one's safe uh, with all these nuclear weapons. Uh, if they're launched, everybody dies. And in fact, the people that don't have the nuclear weapons pointed at them are uh, the least fortunate of all because they'll die horribly. Uh, those of us that are in Boston, if the attack was launched now, we'd be dead in five minutes because we'd be hit by a submarine-based missile from a submarine that's 100 miles off the coast, and we'd all be dead instantaneously. Uh, but in Bermuda and in Tahiti and in Switzerland and in the Sweden, the neutral countries in the world, they die in the dark, starving to death uh, with radioactive burns over the next six months to a year. Uh, so. We have 5% of the world's population here in the United States and 6% of the world's population in the Soviet Union that hold the other 89% of the, of the people in the world and all the birds and animals and squirrels and trees and flowers and butterflies. We're going to kill all them too, you know. They want to live. You know, for those that want to die, I could ask you here in this room, those of you who want to die, raise your hands. I would I'd be sure not a single person would, but for those who, those hateful persons that still live on this planet who want to die, why don't they go out and jump in the river, you know, uh, and let the rest of us go on living? You know, that's, you know, most of us want to live. At least, you know, I, surveys show that most people want to. Uh... <laughs> what we got to have, what, what basically has happened, the thing that has really messed us up is we're like kids with a new toy. And the new toy that we've developed in the last 150 years is technology. Yesterday I spoke at Georgia Tech, mostly to uh, nuclear scientists, uh, nuclear physicists, and so forth. And I, I should have, I didn't tell them what, we ought to get rid of all nuclear power and everything else. I think we, there's a line in the Bible, what God has joined together, let no man rend the sunder. I think it also, they say that at weddings. And I think that really applies to the atoms. So that we ought to leave the atoms together. I mean, we, we haven't had much luck with them. I'll tell you the honest truth. We, we haven't had a lot of luck with them. And, I, and until we solve our social problems uh, and learn to live together in peace and brotherhood all over the planet 
and improve our technology even more, we probably ought to leave them, uh, leave them alone because the damn things are so dangerous, you know, and the, the waste uh, that the, even for, for power purposes, they produce so tremendous amounts of waste that we just don't know what to do with it. It has a half-life of forever, this poisonous, uh, poisonous waste. We've learned to make a lot of poison. But we, what we've done is we've taken high technology and we've, just, we've used it on each other. That was World War II was high tech by people on other people. And when it was over, I mean, you look at the films uh, of World War II, the bombings and uh, the flamethrowers and all these weapons that we unleashed on each other for the first time, and most thinking people realize that we just can't go on and have continue to, uh, to do this. And then the rest of the things we did with high tech, in order to make our lives more comfortable and raise more food and get more wood and everything, we turned the rest of our technology basically around on our environment. Somehow we think that the environment, the world was put here for us to, uh, you know, a lot of people look at trees and just see bored feet. I know I have a number of acres of timberland, and what I see are living creatures that without which I couldn't live because they take carbon dioxide that we exhale and turn it back into oxygen, and they hold the topsoil. I mean, trees, believe it or not, are just as important as we are, and when we cut down all the trees, it's going to be cyanar for us, and that's exactly what we're doing. You know, the nuclear weapons, the hydrogen bomb was invented before the chainsaw. But, brother, you give, you give a guy in the rainforest a handful of chainsaws, put them in tin, and I'm telling you, you can cut down a whole forest in no time. Whereas with an axe, it took a long time to cut down a tree. With a chainsaw, it takes very little. What we're doing with the poisons on our environment here in the United States, and we're the leaders in this, we are dumping on our environment today 600 pounds of toxic chemicals for every, per year for every man, woman, and child uh, in this country. We are literally poisoned. The food we eat is poisoned. The water we drink is poisoned. The, the amount of chemicals we dump on this country is something like 20 times what we dumped on it 15 years ago, and it increases exponentially. Uh, in, in, in California, there are one-tenth the number of bees still left alive that were there 10 years ago. They, they've been killed. Uh, you know, they didn't, the pesticides weren't designed to kill the bees. They were designed to kill caterpillars and things like that. But, uh, but it kills most of the insects. And then the birds have nothing to eat. It's just, it's a disaster. Um, it's, it's very foolish, very short-sighted. And if we don't, if we don't change our policies, uh, there isn't much of a future for us. And, and the thing about it is we can change our policy. And Captain, this is not Ted Turner speaking. This is Captain Cousteau. This is Lester Brown of World Watch Institute. This is Russell Peterson, former Republican governor of Delaware, and executive at DuPont, who ran the Audubon Society, and, and just numerous other people, uh, experts that have really uh, studied, studied the field. Because when I got in the news business, I felt like I had a responsibility to learn what was really going on. Prior to that, you know, I was down in Newport all the time, racing in the America's Cup trials and everything. I really I had a great time. You know, before I knew this, you know, I was having a lot more fun than I am now. I, I wasn't asked to come around and make speeches to colleges, and let me tell you, it didn't bother me one damn bit. Uh, there's no money in making speeches to colleges, you know. You know, uh, but... The other thing is I always enjoyed coming to Harvard because I tried to get in here and didn't succeed. I had to go to Brown. Uh, and I didn't finish there. I finished, but I didn't graduate. But at any rate, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm burdened with all this knowledge. And I, since I was invited to come up here, I thought I'd tell you. Now, the, the good news is that most of this information has just become available in the last few years. Like I said, I, I didn't know much about it before six or seven years ago myself. And I was, even then, a fairly well-informed person. And a problem recognized is a problem half solved. And what the mind of man can conceive and believe, the mind of man can achieve. And if we, if we change our priorities, if we change our priorities and start working on these problems, if we start using, first we must stop the arms race because it's taking half the scientists and engineers in the world, but particularly in the uh, developed countries, the Soviet Union, United States, the two richest uh, well, Japan's actually the richest country in the world, but the two military, military, military powers, uh, until we stop the arms race, we don't have the brain power nor the resources to tackle the other problems, and that's why we need to stop it first. And then together, 
the threat is so great that it really supersedes uh, it really, what different political systems around the planet are not something to die over any more than it's worth dying for Christianity or Judaism or Mohammedanism or whatever. And, and in America, we have already set, we've already set an example of how people from all over the place can uh, get along together and live in relative peace and harmony and cooperate together for the mutual benefit of at least the majority, if not all. And, and really all we have to do is expand the American experience. And the Soviet Union is the same way. They got a hundred different languages in the Soviet Union. They got all kinds of people over there too. And a lot of people over there aren't happy to be in the Soviet Union. When I was up in Estonia watching the yachting events at the, at the Goodwill Games, I talked to the Estonians. They got their own language. They don't even like to speak Russian. They'd like to not be part of the Soviet Union. You know, just like Georgia didn't want to go, or South Carolina didn't want to be part of the United States a hundred years ago. They want out. They ain't getting out, you know, the Soviets want them in, just like anybody that wants, Puerto Rico wants out of the United States, at least some Puerto Ricans do, but we ain't letting them out, right? You know, when you're in, you're in. That's, uh, you know, and if we get our way, Nicaragua will be part of the United States too. You're going to have the vice president up here, but we got some people like it for to be part of, part of the U.S., I guess. It used to be when Samosa was president, it might as well have been. Uh, at any rate, we got to learn to get along. We got to we got to expand the role of the United Nations. If we're going to succeed on this world, it's going to take all the people of the world pulling together. And that doesn't mean that we have to give up our national sovereignty. We can have our national sovereignty, just like Massachusetts and Boston. Boston's got its government. Massachusetts got its. And you love Boston. You love Massachusetts. You can love the United States too. All right. Well, why can't we take it one step forward? forward one last step forward and love everybody in the world. I've done it. I've been all over the world. I'm on every continent in this planet, and except Antarctica, and there's nobody down there but penguins. And I made friends all over the place. People want to be friends. Believe me, it's very easy to make friends with people. All you have to do is treat them with respect and dignity and, and talk to them, look them in the eye, and talk to them. It's the old golden rule. You know, treat other people like you'd like them to treat you. And I'm telling you, as far as I'm concerned, you ain't got no problems anywhere. And you got to look at the good side of things anyway. You know, remember, we're all going to be dead anyhow. I mean, 70 years doesn't last very long at all. It's a very, very short period of time, particularly against the backdrop of all of the billions of years of history and so forth. Uh, so we're going to be dead anyway. We gotta try. We're gonna be dead sooner if we have a nuclear war. Everyone agrees with that. So why don't we try doing it a little different way? Why don't we, why don't we uh, have some foresight? Normally human beings don't, don't, uh, don't prepare for the future very well. They don't think ahead. And it takes some great catastrophe to get them to do so. For instance, until the Titanic sunk, no ocean liners had adequate lifeboat safety. And then, until the airliners started going down, they didn't, uh, uh, crash and they didn't have uh, good safety on airplanes and they didn't have sprinklers in hotels and, and, and theaters, you know, all the theater fires and so forth. And one of the things we've always tried to do after Chicago and San Francisco burned was come up with good ways of putting out fires. I don't see any sprinklers in this room, but we got lots of exits, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, but let me tell you, we aren't, we're not going to be able to rebuild after a nuclear war and if this planet's uh, ecosystem is destroyed, you know, it's going to be a long time before we can build another one. So it really behooves us today, because we're smarter than people were 100 years ago, particularly y'all here at Harvard. Y'all are the smartest people around. You know, it costs $18,000 a year to go here. Somebody's got to be smart just to dig up the money to come. You know, I'm... So we can do it, but it's going to require, it's going to require looking into the future, thinking ahead, doing the intelligent thing, not being afraid to try something new, uh, and it really is a lot of fun. I can tell you, when I was suspicious and hateful, as I was at one time in my life, of Yankees, Southerners, just about everybody, women, and worried the hell out of me. <laughs> All right. When I was that way, I was not near as happy as I am now, when I love everybody, trust everybody, and uh, some people say I'm very naive, but uh, I feel a lot better about things uh, because I think it can get better and I'm looking forward to it. But if it's going to be done, it's going to have to be your generation that does it. And I get around and speak to a lot of colleges. I enjoy doing it, and this is the message, that it's, uh, you're, you're inheriting a world that's in a mess, and a country that's in a mess, too. But you've got two trillion in debt, 
The deficits uh, internally and the trade deficits are catastrophic. We are living beyond our means as a nation, and we've got to stop doing it. We've got to, we've got to uh, bring our consumption and our income into line, or we're going to have a tragic, tragic uh, economic consequences. Uh, those are just intelligent things that everybody knows. And, and but we ought to have the will and the strength to do it. And you're going to have to be the ones that, uh, that do it. But if you do, all these things can be turned around in an incredibly, uh, incredibly quick uh, period of time, in my opinion. And it can all be solved and we can live together in a virtual Garden of Eden here in brotherhood and love and kindness and just uh, keep on going forever, or virtually forever, till the stars go out. Thank you very much. And now let's go for some questions. Okay. Given your remarks and the um, the hope that you have for the future, do you have any political aspirations in any way, ways in which you can help implement some of the? I'm I'm running a, the first global communication system in CNN, and I think that's more important than political office in any one particular country. So, I don't think I have time to uh, run for political office. But I, but, I, but I think we've got some good candidates. We do need good, uh, clear-thinking leadership that's not afraid uh, of the future and not just married to the old World War II, World War I fortress mentality that we have today. And uh, there are several candidates, uh, one in particular that uh, is going to run for president next time, I think, that will, will be very good. Uh, and, but it's better for somebody else to do that. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I, I've got my job in global communications to do. Uh, to bring the discussion down a few notches, the uh, NBA is talking about expanding, and uh, two southern cities, Charlotte and Miami, have applied uh, to get in the league, and I was wondering about your feelings on those. And then second, I was, I was a Braves fan when the only games you could pick up were out of Knoxville, Tennessee, about 10 games a year. And uh, I was wondering if you had any second thoughts about bringing in Chuck Tanner, being as he took his last team from world champions. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, first of all, I, I was not at the Phoenix meeting, and I'm not active, really active, in either sports team at the current time because you, obviously I would have talked about sports if I thought that was an important thing. It's really hard to worry about your sports teams when you've got 25,000 nuclear weapons pointed at you. Uh, at any rate, I really, it will not be my decision where the NBA expands. It'll probably be a year or two, but it won't be my decision. Uh, I hope everyone's happy with the plans for expansion. And I don't really think that Tanner was responsible for the performance of the Braves this year. I think they were 10 or 12 games better off than last year, but uh, it ain't saying much. We're, we're going through a dry spell in baseball. My father said that a few fleas were good for a dog, that they reminded him that uh, that's what he was. And uh, <laughs> basketball team's okay, though, but just shows that nobody's, per nobody's perfect. Yeah, I was um, this summer down in Washington working with um, the uh, President's U.S. Soviet Exchange Initiative and working with the State Department on some questions involving exchanges with Soviet and American athletes. And one of the things that came up was that, because um, I, I appreciate everything you've said, I'm, I'm a big fan of all your programs, and I've been in touch with some of your people in Atlanta, but one of the things that I wanted to see if you could give us your thoughts on is that here we are trying to work out our problems with the Soviets. And down in Washington, there's um, a number of people, I guess call it influential positions, who are having trouble dealing with the way you've handled the goodwill games. And it's almost, it's, it's almost ironic that here we, you're making incredible strides with the Soviets, but yet down in Washington, I, I, I just have heard and have personal experience, and perhaps it's not new to you, that there's some friction with the way um, you dealt with the situation and, and some of it was in the paper and some of it's not and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how you might iron out 
um, your position down in Washington so that something like the Goodwill Games can continue and prosper because I think it adds quite Well, a in 1990, this administration won't be in. I mean, you know, it could be one. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I, you, have to be more, you have to be more specific uh, than that. Uh, I know that the administration, Weinberger, wouldn't let the boxers go, but we kept uh, the administration uh, uh, informed of our plans from the very time that we agreed with the Soviets to do it, but they didn't, uh, they didn't make suggestions to us and we didn't ask for them. We figured uh, this was private enterprise. You know, so I have to, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I wasn't well, uh, on the inside of what they were doing down there, believe it or not. Well, I was over there in Moscow getting the games going. Right, and, but again, this, as you probably well know, the Soviets deal with private individuals, as like yourself or someone like Mr. Hammer or Mr. Kennel at Pepsi, but they also in turn have to deal with our government, and our government, uh, the State Department, is often trying to put together uh, deals of their own along with the initiatives that the president set up. And when we're all trying to work together for the same goal, it, it seems to work against what we're after when our major players, um, you're, you're sort of outside of the government, but I don't think you can disregard that the government also has influence with the Soviets. I, I, no, no one ever said they didn't, I mean, as far as we were concerned. So, but basically, I mean, I, maybe just you haven't heard before, but there are a few people that are, you know, for a lack of a more articulate way, that are pissed off in Washington about the way the Goodwill Games... About what about the Goodwill Games? Just the fact that, the only, you know, I'm just speaking here, say that, that, the, that you tried to pull off your own individual Olympics and that you overstepped the U.S. Olympic Committee. You know, there are, it's ego. Well, it's all, the it's U.S. Olympic ego. Committee was, uh, went on record uh, opposing the withdrawal of the boxers. So, well, I, you know, I got the feeling when the boxers weren't allowed to go that we had a problem there. Right. But that was the first time I knew about it. I mean, right. they didn't tell me anything about it before that. Well, I'm just, I'm just trying to pass on to you that. Well, I appreciate I that. I think you still do. Have the I kind of got, I, I kind of got the message, you know. Well, I, I just think that there, you should go down there and talk to him. Talk to who? I tried to see Reagan and he didn't want to see me. Okay. I asked for permission to come see him. To Pat Buchanan, he used to work at CNN. Yeah. He's, didn't even respond. What about going to go see Cap Weinberger who banned the boxers? Oh, I've seen Cap Weinberger. I tried to get in touch with him on the phone when he held the boxers out and he wouldn't even speak to me. So I tried to get in touch with him and they wouldn't talk. How's that sound? Hey, next question. Or unless you want to go on with it all night. No, 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 no. no. Well, it wasn't some, even a question. If, if, but some, if somebody sets it up, will you go talk to him? Sure, I'll talk to him. I'm up here talking to you for Christ's sake. If the government asks me to talk, I'll say that. Thanks a lot. I'd love to go. They haven't asked me. <laughs> yes, sir. I just want to say thank you um, for your efforts and your concerns with those who are, uh, have sight impairments like myself. And it's been great inspiration for me to uh, pursue my goals in c cable communications. Um, my, first, my question is, is that, uh, one, are you going to or how are you going to bid for the NFL rights for TBS? And two, um, I've been asked by the cable company I work for to ask you that if uh, you find that um, some boxing is uh, violent, why then are you going for football and then also why do you carry wrestling on your uh, service? Why do we carry wrestling? Wrestling because it's popular and I don't think it's violent. The most they ever do is throw each other around, maybe gouge each other in the eyes. You know. <laughs> it, personally, if we, could, if we could fight a war with the Russians and just wrestle, it'd be fine. I mean, that's... A, uh, and people like wrestling. I don't think it's violent. Nobody ever gets killed or whatever. Uh, the other thing is, as far as the NFL is concerned, that's basically up to the cable industry. We're in contact with them. No final decisions have, uh, have been made, but if a bid for the football is made, it will be made uh, in conjunction with the cable operators that are going to put up the bulk of the money. Okay, do you think it'll work for you as opposed to ESPN with their... Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's really, uh, nobody's made up their minds yet. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Good to see you. Yes, sir. How, how far do you think the Excuse me, the last part?
Well, okay. I mean, that's a lot of questions. Any more? Because I've already forgotten the first five. I get the general gist of it. First of all, in our society, we have, we have power is distributed. You know, in our government, it's the judiciary, Congress, and the president. We, we felt that our founding fathers felt that by spreading power around, that was the safest way to run our country. And in those days, they, in the original Bill of Rights, I think it says freedom of the press, and I'm in the press, okay? And they felt that having a free press not controlled by the government was important. And we've stuck to that, right or wrong. And there have been, there have been people like William Randolph Hearst, who allegedly was responsible for the start of the Spanish-American War. He pumped it up in his newspaper so much. Now, I'm trying to stop wars, not start them. But, but believe it or not, I don't conscientiously use CNN. I do not set CNN policy except for the fact that I did set it at the beginning to be sure that it was fair and equitable to everybody. We do not uh, put out hate stuff about the Soviet Union or any other country. We try and be dispassionate uh, and, and as analytical and as honest and as fair in presenting uh, all sides of, of issues both internally in the United States and externally in the, in the rest of the world. Uh, but I don't set that policy. My, my speech here tonight is not, you wouldn't see it on CNN. This is just Ted Turner speaking. I'm not here as the president or owner of CNN. I'm here as Ted Turner individual, friend of Captain Cousteau and others, giving you the benefit of my own personal experiences. Uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong, really, when you come right down to it. Any individual anywhere in a free country has a right to write a book if they want to, an article on the op-ed page, you got writers, uh, they all have influence. College professors, they're supposed to have influence. Uh, if you rise up through our system, uh, Michael Milken, that run Drexel Burnham's junk, well, he's got influence. You, you're gonna have, and, and those of you that are here, I mean, Perry Mason has influence. We run that show, that's our show about lawyers. I mean, it's on every day at noon, when's the time period? It's an old show, too. But uh, <laughs> at any rate, at any rate, uh, you know, what's wrong with that? You know, somebody's going to have influence. You don't want all the power to be in the hands of the government. I mean, just to, you know, we don't, we don't have a king in this country. We're not supposed to, or a dictator. We've got a president. He's only in for eight years max. You know, so, you know, I would like to see our overall leadership in this country, in business, in government, and overall, be more forward-looking. I'm very, very concerned. We don't have a 20-year plan for this country. We don't even have a five-year plan. We don't even, the government runs out of money every six months and they don't, you know, approve to borrow more until after they've already run out. You know, that's not more way to run a country. We don't have any plan for the world. There's no global plan. You know, we're just pulling out, cutting down on the UN and so forth. We're not being very good leaders. All we're doing is spending more than we're making. So we're not doing a good job. So, you know, if we were doing a perfect job, I don't know. I mean, I, I think an individual's trying to do something about it's good myself, you know. Maybe they're wrong, maybe they're right. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Yes, ma'am. The first, Captain Cousteau, talking with him, I went and spent a week with him on the Calypso when they were filming the Amazon series. I happened to find a, uh, a little book that someone had sent me years before that I hadn't read. I picked it up and read it, a paperback called uh, The Limits to Growth. It was the original work of the Club of Rome. Then I read the global report, uh, the President's report on the year 2000 under the Carter administration. And I met Russell Peterson and I get reinforcement everywhere I went. I started looking. I said, my God, it's just like the theory of relativity or something like that. I came up with a new theory. I mean, I just kind of found it. It took years, and I kept studying, and I kept talking with people. All my old right-wing, ultra-conservative buddies, I talked with them about it. I said, what do you think of this? They closed, some of them closed their mind to it. You know, I said, no, that's wrong. You know, just like, you know, in the monkey trial, you know, Genesis, Exodus. But you had Jerry Falwell here. I mean, he's a friend of mine. I know him. We carry his program. You're going to have Jesse Jackson. I mean, Carl Sagan. I've talked to a lot of experts. Carl Sagan reinforced uh, what I was saying. The smart people know that this is happening. They know all over the world. But a lot of people don't know about it. And y'all are going to be smart people. Well, you already are. Got to know the right stuff. Who's next? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Turner, my little sister said to say thanks for Leave It to Be Yours. It's a great show. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. 
When you were a young man and you left Brown to run your family's business because of a family tragedy, um, you quoted a scripture, what your mind can, con can um, conceive, you can achieve. Did you think those things as a young man, and how did you achieve your goals to what you are today? Well, I had... Uh, I was very close to my father and I had an excellent business training. When I was 12 years old, my father put me to work in the billboard company, out of military school, straight out of school for the summer, working as a laborer. And I, I, I was water boy when I was 12 and I learned how to build, put billboards up on telephone poles and I learned how to post the paper up there one summer and I really knew a lot. And when I was 24, I probably had at least the experience of a 30 year old. I was an old man when I was 24. Uh, because I was on such a rigorous work program. Uh, so I was really uh, technically capable of taking the company over, even though it was technically bankrupt and so forth. And I just, uh, it was basically a sound business, and I turned it around. Uh, and by the time I was 30, I'd made enough money to uh, buy a little television station. I didn't like the billboard business because it was easy. I made a lot of money. It's like junkyards. It was it's easy to make money. Making money never really turned me on. That's why I did all this uh, racing that I did. I, I like excitement and challenges. Uh, but I've made a lot of money. I mean, in television, I made a lot of money. I spent a lot. I owe over a billion dollars now, uh, which is, I guess, is, I guess is a sign of something. I owe two billion uh, just a couple of months ago. We just paid off a half a billion of the liquidation of some assets at MGM. And, uh, and I work on making money, because I have to make money to make my programs go and to make everything else go. And I enjoy work. I really do. I work uh, because I, I feel like I'm doing some, something worthwhile. I enjoy my work a lot more now that I'm working for more than just making money. But I've got to make money in order to do it. It's uh, like putting runs on the board in a, with a baseball team. So it's no big deal. You know, it's easy to make money, I think. You know, a lot of real dummies make money. I mean, you know, it's uh, not anything really that challenging. And I hope those of you that uh, want to make money, and there's nothing wrong with doing it because it's nice for houses and boats and cars and all that sort of thing. You buy a lot with it. Uh, but I hope that you'll have other purposes in your lives, like making a contribution, because you'll be a lot happier than if you just live for money. The people I've seen that just live for money are a miserable lot. The people of college professors, those that are living a life of service, are happier. But there's nothing wrong with mixing the two together. But just, uh, there isn't. But you've got to have that balance in your life if you're going to be truly successful and happy. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, when you brought up the uh, situation, the hypothetical situation of... Uh, you've got to speak right into when it. You, when you brought up the hypothetical situation of the uh, termites uh, destroying the home, uh, don't you think that... Uh, population control and that um, population control and and the food distribution of the of the whole world should come under a world government you don't you don't agree with that I don't think we can come under a world government I don't think that will work and I don't think it's right uh, I think that the, 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 the way the United Nations model if we strengthen it and, and put a little more attention to it and, and put more effort into it, that's the, the only way it'll work. I do not think that we're going to have a uh, world government anytime soon, maybe 200 years from now. But uh, we do have to, it, it's, up to, it's up to every individual and every individual nation, really, to paddle its own canoe. Each nation must decide how much, how many people its country can carry on a, on a sustainable basis and then move towards, uh, move towards, uh, implementing that and and China is doing a really excellent job and I know Jerry Falwell doesn't like abortion I know he was here and I had the greatest my greatest comment to Jerry Falwell I said ended up in my office three years ago I said Jerry abortion is not murder and he said oh yes it is I said I can prove to you it's not he said no you can I said yes I can I said you're not born until you're actually naturally born and, and he said, no, that's not true. I said, yes, it is, because you don't have funerals. Even in your church, you don't have funerals for miscarriages, do you? <laughs> There's your answer on that. Wow. Now, you, 
you don't solve a problem by sending food from the nations that have food to the nations that don't have food. That is not, that's only a stop gap deal. It doesn't work. Everyone's got to, you, by, by putting half the world on charity, or at the end of giving them uh, surplus wheat at the end of a, a bread line, that doesn't solve the problem. You've got to teach these people have to be able to raise their own food. That's the only way that it works uh, for any continuing basis. Nobody in this room is expecting to be a charity case. You're all going to go out and earn your own way in the world. And that's what everybody's got to do. You've got to earn your own way in the world, and each nation has to own its, earn its own way in the world. But they may have to have some help to get started. There's nothing wrong with that, just like children getting started, like your parents educate the children. But in the long run, adults have got to take care of themselves. Don't you think that we have to start right here at home with you population bet. control then? You bet. We sure do. We and sure do. We haven't. Well, you bet. That's why I'm here. That's what I was saying. We're, we're acting very irresponsibly in this country. We should be the world leaders. But we're not. We're the world leaders in spending more than we make. That's what we are. We're the world leaders in pollution. We're the world leaders in uh, the arms race at the current time because the Soviets want to quit and we don't. We're not doing a good job right now. And if it's going to be changed, this group in this room is going to have to do it because uh, uh, it's going to require uh, uh, changes in the way we uh, think about ourselves and the way we run ourselves. We've got, we got to go to a new model. We can't use the old model of the past. Listen, uh, We've really gone about the right, and right amount of time. I don't like to run over. Better to be short than too long. Thank you very much for being here. It's a real honor for me.